All right, so thank you to, uh, to Benny for uh, the invitation and opportunity to comment in an area that I've thought about uh, for a long time. Um, and so I decided to take a kind of weird approach to my discussion. I decided to say, okay, the research question is index <coughs> fund incentives. What answers would I give based on everything I know from the past, my prejudices and whatever, before reading the paper, right? And then compare what I would have said to what Ben <laughs> Chuck and Hurst said as a way of saying what's newer or less obvious and maybe um, also some sense of what might be missing. Okay, so first of all, um, you know, I, I've been thinking about this area for a long time, um, maybe not quite as long as, as Lucian has, but, but getting there. Um, <laughs> and uh, you know, there's, there's great admiration for Lucian's energy in this project, right? He's seen much of a, a newer generation of, of, of corporate uh, governance scholars, uh, several of whom are present at this conference, one of whom he's just disagreed with in this current paper. Um, unlike me, I've kind of drifted off into health policy and causal inference methods. But I'm a one-time participant in this space, so I have some opinions. Um, so here's an opinion from 20 years ago, okay, from an overview of, of corporate governance activism by institutions before hedge funds. And uh, so I concluded, based on the evidence at that time, that a small number of institutional investors, mostly public pension funds, spend a trivial amount of money on overt activism efforts. They don't conduct proxy fights. They rarely try to elect their own candidates to the board of directors. There are a bunch of reasons, including legal rules, 13D being one of the most prominent uh, among them, um, agency costs within the institutions, um, collective action problems, why they don't do much, uh, but at the end of the day, they don't do much. The currently available evidence is consistent with the institutions achieving the effect on firm performance that one <coughs> might expect from this trivial level of activity. Uh, namely, uh, not much, okay? Uh, let me say what I might say about index funds, which weren't really on the agenda then. So I might say, okay, the first sentence is still right, right? The index funds spend a trivial amount of money on overt activism efforts. They don't conduct proxy fights. They rarely, if ever, try to elect their own candidates to the board of directors. I want to come back to the reasons, um, because I think Lucian and uh, Scott do a good job of developing all the reasons why this is true, some of which are different for the index funds than for public pension funds. And so the currently available evidence is consistent with their achieving the amount that they would expect to achieve from investing trivial energy, namely not much. But then one might add, what they do do, or can do, is provide crucial support to this new institution, the activist hedge funds, who do all this stuff. Right, who engage in active, in overt activism, who run proxy fights, who try to elect their own directors. And the activists rely on the traditional institutions for voting support and uh, in some cases for, uh, for investment, not for the index funds, but they do get investment from the public pension funds. Right? And the evidence collected by, I, I, I would say, is mostly positive. Um, some of it uh, Lucian has participated in. Um, and so the activists let the passive funds achieve indirectly, at least part of what they can't achieve uh, directly. That's what I would say today. Okay, so that's background, right? What I would say before I read the paper. <clears throat> so let's now look at what's new and different in, uh, in Bevchuk and, first, and Hearst. Um, so first, they collect evidence on what the index funds actually do. Well, that's important, even if it, much of it matches my priors. Uh, as an empirical scholar, which is most of what I do, I hate referee letters that say, the authors have new evidence on X. X is an important topic, but I kind of thought that already. Reject. <laughs> right? Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> new evidence doesn't always confirm your priors, and even when it does, it's important. Um, a second, we learn uh, from their uh, data collection <coughs> that the index funds are more passive than uh, the public pension funds. Not completely passive, but more passive. And that's new. We didn't know that. We didn't know that. We knew they didn't do much, but did they do more or less than the public pension funds? I didn't do that. However, when they do act, I'd like to know, do they act more sensibly than the public pension funds, who, after all, have a different set of, of political incentives? And the authors don't get at that, and maybe they can't, but I want to view that as an unknown question here. 
Consistent with their incentives, the indexers are cautious about supporting the activists. What I don't know is whether their decisions when to support and when not are sensible at the margin. We can't really get at that because we can't get into firm specific uh, in information, right? And so again, that's an unknown here, right? We don't want to support all activists all the time. There's some optimal level of activism. How close are we to that optimum? And would we come closer if the indexers uh, were more supportive? Um, uh, then they develop reasons for the near passivity of the indexers that are specific to index funds, right? Um, some of the reasons overlap with index fund with the public pension funds. Uh, the most important new reason is their fear of political reaction to their own power, right? This is related, as the authors understand, to Mark Rowe's work on the <coughs> politics behind American rules uh, that weaken financial institutions and to his idea that the principal competition for Delaware in attracting corporate charters is not other states, but the fear that the federal government will come and override Delaware. I think the principal competition for the indexers at this point may be that same fear that the government is going to come and do something to them, including breaking them apart, as Lucen suggested at the end of his, <coughs> his talk. And their best way to avoid getting broken apart is not to do much. Um, okay, let me turn to what's missing or, or, or underplayed. Um, so I think that your study complements case studies of particular investors. So uh, Marco Beck, who's here today, and Julian Franks, who, who is not, have been notably active in this space. And, and so I would urge you to discuss that overlap and complementarity. So I want to look at institutional investor activism and engagement as a map where the indexers are one piece, the public pension funds are another, the more active traditional institutions are a third, and uh, the activist hedge funds are, uh, are a fourth. Now, second direction I might suggest you go in, and this is probably a separate, a separate project, you've done a lot of data collection for this project, would be to think about collecting soft um, interview-based evidence on what the index funds actually do when they, quote, engage uh, close quote along the lines of an old project of mine looking at UK uh, institutional investors um, black and coffee in 1994 um, the indexers won't tell you much uh, but maybe the companies that they engage with will um, maybe some of the activist hedge funds will uh, it would be worth exploring what you could get people to tell you in off the record interviews uh, what's also missing, and, and really hard to get at, this is not so much a criticism as an observation, what, how much overall investor activism do we want after all? Similar to questions of how many overall securities <coughs> litigation lawsuits do we have? The optimal number isn't zero, it isn't everything, it's somewhere in the middle, we don't really know where it is. Same thing for takeover activity. Especially given the existence of activist hedge funds and some of these moderately active regular institutions, if we could get the indexers to do more, would we want this given their weak incentives, right? And their incentives are indeed very weak, and the paper does a nice job of pointing this out, um, but it's not that we know what to do about the fact that they have weak uh, incentives. I, my view is the index fund incentives are indeed lousy and can't be fixed, right? They're not going to beat their direct competitors, other index funds, by making good governance decision. Um, I want to again compare my, my UK uh, study with, with Jack Coffey, um, where we learned that the UK activism comes entirely from the overweighted institutions, the ones who own more of this company than the market as a whole. The underweighted will never participate because if good things for this company are bad things for them, right? They lose out relative to their close competitors in terms of relative performance. Um, the indexers are equal weighted. That just doesn't give them much incentive uh, to do anything. They have tiny, tiny incentives, and the paper tells you how tiny they are. Um, but effectively, they're in, they're, they have, you know, th their incentives are roughly neutral. That's better than it could be, right? They're not empty voters with incentives to make the companies do worse, um, but it ain't great. Then. I'd like to see you do more with the role of the indexers and the other traditional investors as supporting the activists, as being cl 
crucial support for the activist hedge funds. The activist hedge funds can't get anywhere without voting support from the major traditional uh, institutions. Um, now, they sometimes get it from the indexers. What I don't know is whether they should get it more than they do now, where it's not just, you know, what's the effect of the activism engagement on this company that they target, but what's the spillover deterrent effect on other companies, um, where are companies, where do companies maybe become more short-sighted because they're scared that an activist is going to come at them, rightly or wrongly, <coughs> the evidence suggests wrongly, but the managers uh, may be tough to convince on that. That's a tough question. Right now, the role of the index funds in supporting activists is peripheral uh, to your story. You have two pages at the very end. And I want to suggest that it should be more central to the positive role that the indexers can, uh, can play. Um, lastly, for the audience, I want to stress that in the US, the crucial nature of our 13D rules these are one of the major rules that pacify institutional investors. If you are over 5%, as these guys now often are, and you do much of anything, you have to file a 13D. That basically disables these big three from doing much of anything because they aren't willing, for good reason, to incur the expense and exposure of filing 13Ds. And there we kind of have two options. One is we can change our 13D rules, make the threshold 10% instead of 5%. Um, but uh, we know what Wachta Lipton will think about that. Um, and it's not politically palatable right now. And the only other alternative may be to say, look, maybe we do have to think about limiting the aggregate size of the indexers just to keep them under, under this arbitrary 5% threshold that we set way back when for some completely different reason, because otherwise we've used regulation to pacify them. Leave aside that their incentives are lousy to begin with. We basically said, stop. If you're over 5%, stop. Don't do very much because it's risky. Right? And that's been a problem in US corporate governance for a long time um, that's now coming to hit uh, the index funds. Um, okay, so, so that's it. Overall, clearly, I'm much more on uh, Lucian's side of the fence that the index funds incentives are problematic, um, and I'm not so optimistic that we can do much about them, um, but maybe it's not so bad if you look at the big picture. Given your evidence and what Black discussed, a more, a more suitable uh the research topic would be when do they intervene and why, given that that's the exception. Perhaps from the cases that they do intervene, we can understand uh, what's the reason. Do they serve their family or funds? Mean interests? They, when do they do private engagement? So, right. there's two things about it. One is they give some information in the report about this, and basically, they intervene uh, in uh, when their kind of governance guidelines, they view them as especially violated, or when they focus on a particular team in a given year, let's say female representation, then they might contact companies that don't have any women uh, uh, on the board. Now, we can't tell completely because other than State Street, Vanguard and BlackRock, do not provide a list of the companies with which we co they communicate. And one of our recommendations is actually to require disclosure of this information as well as the content of the communication. Do they engage more in companies that their uh, family of funds, like Vanguard, or owns more of a certain uh, stock? Do they, are they more likely to engage well, with they're this? They're more stuff? likely to engage when uh, uh, they have large positions. Uh, okay. uh, or the family. Say uh, is it they, their large position or the family large position? The family of funds large I position. I think that you, you mean the indexers for each of those uh, are big three. The passive part is a large fraction is the great majority, so there isn't really a difference. A great majority of each of those big three is in a passive fund. 
The objective of these funds is to maximize the returns to their, uh, the money that is coming in. That is their primary objective, their commitment to their clients. Well, no, that's under the no agency problem, mm -hmm. you would see that they would maximize the interest of the beneficial investor. Right, right. But our concern is that in a standard financial economics framework, you would think maybe they are maximizing their own interests no, I and that might diverge with respect to stewardship choices from what's optimal for the beneficial investors. No, but, but many times vote by feet is optimal than vote by proxy. So intervention is a vote by proxy and there's a theory literature which shows that you know oftentimes I have actually a paper in JFE that vote by feet is a, is a better choice. So there's yes, but, but for the index funds, sure. But for the index funds, vote by feet is just not an option because they are hardwired. No matter, I mean, they might think that this company is performing terribly. It's outrageous. It's morally atrocious. But they are just committed to keeping the same position throughout. That's the way this, the index fund is committed legally to act. So these passive funds. Right. Those are, we are focusing in this paper. Uh, we discussed the in the 2017 paper, we discussed also the active funds, where we think that the agency, mm -hmm. by the way, one of the things that we stress uh, is that even though we focus in this paper on index funds just because they are economically so important, we don't take the view that the active funds, the active mutual funds, are much better. They are different. But in some respects, their agency problems are worse. In some respects, they are better. So uh, uh, we are focusing on the index funds here because they are a special case and they are a sufficiently important special case. Thank you. <coughs> uh, last question. Uh, so I actually like Bernie's take on things that we shouldn't look so much about what these uh, passive owners actually do, but how they actually support the activists. And I wonder whether there wouldn't be some simple tests of that. For example, how many times do they actually support activist proposals? So we don't want this to be zero, and we don't want this to be 100. We want to have some number in between which shows that they actually exercise some discrimination. Are uh, saying how many times do they, for example, vote along with ISS recommendations? How many times right. do they actually? So, so, so there are some studies. Uh, the Alon Graf et al. has a study that suggests that there are more differential than active funds. We have uh, uh, an empirical uh, work in progress on on this question, uh, and the results of this paper of what we have are that they. There is evidence suggesting that they might be too little supportive <coughs> of activist hedge funds. But I want to stress, because this is also something that Bernie said, that even as, let's suppose for a moment that they are acting optimally in votes on proxy fights with activists. The reason why that wouldn't be enough, that wouldn't be enough to allay our concerns, is because activist hedge funds can address only certain type of governance failures. For example, only because basically their business model is such, if you call an activist and you say this company has some governance, some optimal processes, and we can raise their value by 8% if we change their governance, they would say I'm not interested. There isn't enough money for me to take a position uh, 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 and fight for a year or two and maybe make this return because it wouldn't be after my fees. I can't <coughs> operate here. Now, the big three and other index funds are actually taking the view that there are all kinds of changes that they would like to see. They support, for example, staggered boards. They support other arrangements. Now, all of those things are things that if they were to do various simple steps, they would be able to accomplish across the board. The hedge fund activists are not a remedy for this because uh, uh, even though a hedge fund activist could easily take a position, bring a shorter proposal to declassify the board, 
have the index funds vote for it, have the change made in a year or two. It's just not economically beneficial for it. And therefore, there is a whole range of governance problems that the big three have expressed deep commitment to fixing, which now they are not fixing, and that hedge fund activism cannot be a remedy for, even if the index fund were to vote optimally on hedge fund activist contests. Thank you. Thank you. We have a break right now.